हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल सभी को मेरा नमस्कार माय नेम इज अशोक रूपने एंड आई एम स्पीकिंग फ्रॉम द कैंपस ऑफ द आई सर पुणे एंड यू नो वी डू लॉट ऑफ आउटरीच फॉर द स्टूडेंट टीचर्स एंड द जनरल पब्लिक बिफोर स्टार्टिंग आवर सेशन आई वुड लाइक टू मेक अ स्मॉल टूर फॉर यू वर्चुअल टूर फॉर द ऑफ द आई सर पुणे now let me show you so this is a building of the aisar pune and here actually we have the various departments now one more picture i would like to show you and that is very very interesting and what is that this is a court of the aisar pune the aisar pune fair tomorrow science begins today and this court is very very appropriate for our uh, series now one more picture i would like to show you and what is that we conduct lot of outreach activities so this is a student activity we invite lot of students from the various schools and the colleges and also teachers from the various uh, schools and the uh, colleges uh, we celebrate the various days like the national science day teachers day children's day and yesterday we celebrated zero shadow day abhi dekhiye hame aisa lagta hai ki har din सन हमारे माथे पे आता है ओहरे डाता है ऐसा नहीं होता है इट्स हैपन्स ओनली टू टाइम्स इन अ ईयर बिटवीन द ट्रॉपिक्स एंड येस्टरडे वी ऑब्जर्व जीरो शाडो डे इन द पुणे मतलब हमारे सिर के ऊपर कल सन था एग्जैक्टली exactly हमारा जो शाडो था हमारे पैर के बीच में था और इफ यू प्लेस एनी सेंड्रिकल ऑब्जेक्ट इन द सन उसका शाडो कास्ट नहीं होगा और वो टाइमिंग था 12:31 इन पुणे और यह अलग अलग लोकेशन पे अलग अलग डे पे होगा तो येस्टरडे वी ऑब्जर्व हियर जीरो शाडो डे सो वी कंडक्ट एज आई मैंशन यू फेरियस सेशन लाइक वर्कशॉप्स फॉर द टीचर्स एंड द स्टूडेंट अब ये पिक्चर देखो इसमें आपको पता चलेगा कि बच्चे कितने खुश हैं यहाँ जब बच्चे आते हैं कि उनको पता नहीं चलता कि हाफ डे कब जाता है फुल डे कब बिता जाता है तो दे ऑलवेज इंजॉय these type of the hands on demonstration activities and the uh, workshops workshop mein hum bachcho ko material provide karte hain and they make the things with their own hand or whatever they make they take it back so this is a whole idea of hands on science activity center yahan hum bachcho ko encourage karte hain ki apne model science ke ya mathematics ke खुद बना दो और लर्न द बेसिक कंसेप्ट बिहाइंड इट तो अभी तो दो साल बिल्कुल वर्चुअल चल रहा था नाउ वी स्टार्टेड द फिजिकल सेशंस एवरी वेनजडे वी इनवाइट वी इनवाइट स्टूडेंट्स एंड द टीचर्स फ्रॉम द वेरियस स्कूल्स एंड कॉलेजेस फॉर द सेशंस वी आल्सो कंडक्ट टीचर्स वर्कशॉप इन पर्सन वर्कशॉप फिजिकल वर्कशॉप दिस इज द वन ऑफ द फोटोग्राफ ऑफ द टीचर्स वर्कशॉप और आपको पता चलेगा जैसे बच्चों की आँख में चमक थी वैसे टीचर की आँख में भी चमक देखो टीचर्स कितने खुश होते हैं इफ दे लर्न द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ द साइंस एंड मैथमेटिक्स थ्रू द फीरियस एक्सपेरिमेंट ना अभी आज के एपिसोड की तरफ हम चलते हैं टूडे वी आर डूइंग फिफ्टी सेकेंड एपिसोड ऑफ ऑनलाइन डेमोस्ट्रेशन सीरीज और आपको मालूम होगा लगभग ये जर्नी हमने शुरू किया था दो साल पहले दो साल पहले और आज हम बना रहे हैं 50 आज हम आपके लिए कर रहे हैं 52 टू एपिसोड और अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस वी आल्सो कंडक्टेड 15 अनदर सेशंस इन मराठी विथ हेल्प ऑफ द एस सी आर टी महाराष्ट्र और आज का जो टॉपिक है एंड दैट इज वेरी वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग द व्हाट इज द नेम ऑफ द टूडेज टॉपिक द वंडर्स ऑफ द एनिमल किंगडम और ये टॉपिक के लिए टूडे वी हैव इन्वाइटेड टू स्टूडेंट from the aisar pune they are doing their bsms degree so the name of the students are harshal pandit and ninath salgaukar so i am requesting harshal please start our today's session now it's over to you harshal good morning everyone my name is harshal pandit and i am a first year bsms student here at aisar pune today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic that is more or less ignored in our regular academics You might have heard dogs howl in the night and that might have made you lose sleep. So and made you annoyed a lot. So have you ever thought why do they howl? Do they make fun of us and don't they actually make efforts to make, make us not sleep? It's not actually the case. There is a very deep reason behind why dogs and wolves and other canines howl. So that will be the topic of our conversation today. we'll be talking about how animals behave and why do they do that and what is the benefit of such behavior so we'll start with the pack behavior 
Why do wolves and dogs hug? There's actually a very deep reason behind it. Whenever it, the wolves and dogs generally howl when it's dark. And what happens in the dark is you can't really see your teammates, your other wolves in the pack. And to inform, to know their position and to know that if they're around us, they have to make some kind of sign so that everyone else knows. And that's why they howl. Because howling is such a high-pitched sound, an unusual sound. And they can recognize each other's howl and they are they feel much more safe and secure when they hear this howl. They also use this technique to uh, like make aware of other members of the pack of possible prey that they can hunt, hunt together. Because in, uh, in times of scarce food, this tactic actually is very beneficial because you don't find food easily and when you find it, you have to uh, take the chance and get it. So this is a very interesting and very intelligent uh, way the animals have developed uh, an instinct, unless you can say. You might have also heard of an alpha, like an anim uh, in a group, animals fight with each other and wh whoever is the most strongest becomes the alpha. But that is not actually the case in most species, especially wolves, where the term was originated. The alpha wolf in a pack is actually just the breeding male. Basically, he's the father, he's the parent to everyone, almost everyone else in the pack, except for the breeding female, which is also sometimes called as the alpha female. So yeah, this, this notion of an alpha is actually fundamentally wrong. It, 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 has to be, uh, it has to be dominant over all, all its members because he's, he's the parent that he has to take care of all, its mem all the members because they're, they're his kids. And we, you might have also heard that wolves mate for life, but that is also not true. Their relationship statuses are as volatile as humans, or if not more. As they, they can have several relationships in their lifetime, they can change mates every year. And basically, a pack can generally only has one alpha female, one female. You might ask me now, what happens to the offspring? What if there's a small cub female? What what does it what they happen with? How, what happens with that? No, they don't kill her. The 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 female actually goes off looking for another pack to take part in because inbreeding can only call, is is not a good method to diversify your genes and to survive better so that's why the female actually goes off searching for another pack whenever it is mature like around two two and a half years so all these uh, misconceptions i would like you to clear that wolves uh, wolves don't howl for fun and there's no such thing as an alpha wolf they they don't they are not dominant because they have fought everyone else in the pack and there's no such thing as uh, mating for life. Life is not that, not as beautiful, even in the animal kingdom. So now we'll talk about another group that is much more interesting and what they do as a group is even more interesting. You might have seen birds all around you going in large flocks, sometimes thousands, if not, uh, if not ten thousands and all. And you, you might have seen them fly long distances, especially the larger birds. Have you ever wondered why do they do that? Why do they need to travel such long distances like thousands of kilometers? The reason why they do that is pretty fundamental. They do it for food. What happens is where they live, there, there are seasons. There's winter, there's monsoon. You, you know all the seasons. And where they live, they also have seasons. But where, they can get to extremes. The winters in the north can get to a very extremes, uh, extreme uh, lengths. And the temperature drops below zero and they, it's really hard to find food in that case. And birds need a lot of food. The flying is not easy. So what they do is they look for, they, they go and look for a warmer climates. And by warmer climates, generally it means south, but it may mean several different things uh, depending on what bird you are and what region you are but they basically go towards a warmer climate or a climate or a region where there's food available in plenty and yeah that's why they migrate and just for food they do migrate but uh, such an interesting uh, method they've developed 
to combat this problem of food just travel the half the uh, around the globe to uh, solve this problem of food this is such an interesting way now they also fly in these interesting shapes they fly in v shapes have you ever wondered why just v shapes why not some other shapes that may look more pleasing to the eyes say a square shape why don't they why don't they make formations like they do in air shows and all it's it's very smart actually they they're using a a very advanced physics concept have you might have seen planes when they fly through clouds you can see the cloud twisting around the back around the back of their wings on the tips of the wings are uh, twister forms so what happens in in large birds that the migratory birds the same thing happens the bird when it when it is gliding when it is going through the air it also forms a vortex at the tip of its uh, wings so at, and this vortex goes like this and at one point behind the bird it is actually pointing upwards so this the wing it the vortex is like this and the vortex at one point behind the exactly behind the tip of the wing it's pointing upwards so if a bird flies at that pos- exact position it is actually easier for the bird to travel because it's basically gliding so using this very simple physics method they figured out just by instinct just by doing it uh, they nobody taught us they didn't have physics professors but they learned this and they say learn to save 30% of their energy so they act, if they fly in v shapes they save 30% of their energy now this comes with setbacks like the the bird in the front has to work more because it is not being helped he is it is helping the other birds in the flock but that is just countered by them rotating the birds and not having one person fly for a long time and one more question that may come to your mind how do they not get lost i go out sometimes in my the pune city and i may get lost and i have to look at the google maps to find my way back how do they travel thousands of miles and still get to their destination how do they not go around in circles that is actually a open question for you all because a, a concrete answer is not yet found for that people say that it's a knowledge passed down through generations like older birds know the know the path the younger birds follow and the younger birds learn from them and people some people say that bra- like the brains of these birds have this region that allows them to basically understand what way they are going in they, they know the they they can interact with the earth's magnetic field and know if they are going in the north direction or the south direction and all that stuff this this theory the research is still going on and there's one more theory that they might take help of the uh, wind currents there's a theory that they might follow the sun like or based on the position of the sun and the time of the day they know the direction some say stars but we birds rarely travel at night so yeah there are several theories but there has been no concrete uh, explanation for how do they do this so i want you to think about it now let's move on to one more social group that is that i find very fascinating and those are colonies colonies of insects you might have seen colonies of bees ants wasps termites aphids but why do you form colonies why not just exist on your own like house flies and fruit flies there's a there's a very significant advantage if you if you have form colonies if you form colonies you can easily distribute labor you don't need you one organism doesn't has to care about everything else it can just care about one thing that is it is assigned so a worker bee can just just gather nectar and so and another kind of bee let's say a male bee can only take care of the larvae and not care about anything else and suppose and in ants ants have ants have very interesting hierarchies they have several social social, uh, social segregate they are socially segregated so that everyone knows what they have to do there are ants who gather food there are ants who protect there are ants that take care of the young and there are ants that take care of the queen protect the queen so 
there are several uh, people to do the specific jobs and so no single organism has uh, has a burden and if you have colonies even if few organisms are eaten or die you have a high chance of survivability because you are your numbers are big like if you have if you are a 1 million strong colony a few hundred ants get eaten it doesn't really affect you it's like one is like 0.1% of your whole being it won't affect you and these colonies are very crucial to the ecosystem actually because they bring a lot to it bees pollinate bees try help to increase the diversity in the uh, plant kingdom by by pollinate cross pollination basically they when they extract nectar from flowers they take pollens with them too and they transport the pollens to other flowers that germinate them and that that way the cross pollination is possible and diversity is increased the survivability of plants is also like influenced in like exponentially and that's why uh they they survive a lot so yeah bees help plants survive and improve and basically thrive also ants are nature scavengers they can basically break down anything there's a carcass they will find ants they this they can they can uh, basically devour a bull carcass very easily and basically what they do is when they do that they basically break down all the organic matter so that even small organisms like bacteria can uh, easily decompose the rest of the stuff so yeah without ants maybe the world would have been a lot more dirtier than it is right now and they have very interesting ways they deal with predators as well they come across several predators of several sizes and bees can go against predator of any size they they can square against predator of hundreds of times hundreds of times larger than themselves how because they have a very powerful weapon called a sting bumblebees have uh, this sting that they can uh, that if they uh, inject in someone it can basically pacify them and, and if enough bees sting that intruder it can mortally wound them and even kill few, several animals but it comes with the cost of course because if a bee stings someone it might not it might only live for like 30 minutes and then die off so yeah there is there are trade offs but still it's a higher survivability like even if few bees die because of the attack there you have several hundred bees to carry on the lineage and you can also add the ants as well ants also have these very interesting characters like they have a complete soldier uh, category that there are soldier ants specialized soldier ants that they they have heads completely filled with muscles and jaws so these muscles power these jaws and these jaws are the most powerful uh, in all of their colonies and they can they are basically the warrior the defenders of the colony so they have specialized bodyguards basically and it's very interesting how they developed this hierarchy this differentiation within one single colony one single queen mother can produce such differentiated organisms a worker bee uh, let's see a good example on how they deal with predators so here in this image you can see a very large ant a smaller ant and a much smaller ant so this uh, uh, the medium ant let's call it the medium ant it's carrying a leaf and the smaller ant is like sitting on the leaf these are actually leaf cutter ants so what happens is the the minor the major ant which is the medium ant it is carrying the leaf and the smaller minor ant the small ant that you see is sitting on the leaf not because it wants a free ride no that is not the reason the reason it's standing on it's sitting on the leaf is because ants just don't have large predators they have smaller ones as well ants can be infected by parasites by other bugs they can intrude in their head and basically germinate into large organisms and eat the ants from within and that's not good for a colony because the whole colony can can be affected by such intrusions so what this smaller ant does is it picks off any such small organisms that come into contact like 
they can that can come into contact with this major ad and it takes care of the that and and the big giant ant that you see all of these are carpenter ants you can see the differentiation in the same species this smaller ant you can see this big large head this whole head is almost completely muscle and that makes the jaw very very strong that's how they fight like they in one bite they can separate the the abdomen of other ants just one bite in just one fell swoop and so this hierarchy creates a sense of uh, dependability like worker ants can focus on carrying the leaf the small ant can focus on defending the worker ant and the soldier ant just focuses on defending them and not about the food so very interesting organization that ants have created now let us talk about a very interesting phenomena that happens in the animal kingdom uh you might have seen uh, chameleons you might have heard of uh, animals that just blend in with the surroundings and so uh let's do an activity i need you i want you to find out find out the animal in these pictures so in this first picture can you see the animal i'll give you 5 seconds the animal in this picture is actually a satanic leaf-tailed gecko you can see in the middle it's a straight it has a leaf for a tail and that's hence the name so you can see that it actually almost looks like a plant if if i if it were if this picture wasn't a close up of the animal you wouldn't have spotted it in the wild because it's so hard it's the the tail is basically a leaf and the whole body has a texture as if it's a plant interesting na no? then let's see let's see another picture do you see an animal here okay if you do recognize the animal write the answer in the chat box uh the stick above that is the there are three sticks the stick above that is horizontal is actually a stick insect it it's an insect that looks almost exactly like a stick if you if it is in the jungle you won't be able to figure it out believe me it is very hard it, it especially if it is in a bunch of other sticks you can see the two antennae or eyes that come out at the left end next picture Ah, uh, this is quite simple, but you'll figure it out easily. Type in the chat box. Yeah, it's it's actually a moth, a very interesting creature. The, there are several species of moth that blend into uh, their surroundings, and basically that basically helps them survive predators. If you are an owl, if you are a predator, and you there's a tree and there's a moth on it. and the patterns of the moth and the tree are almost exactly the same as you see in this picture imagine this picture but 10 times smaller and on a tree among tens of hundreds of trees you won't be able to see this it's just not possible and that's how they improve their survivability that's how they ensure that they survive one more picture now if you find this this is this is a commendable one you can type in the chat box This was pretty hard. I I spent ten minutes finding this one. Yep, it's it's a giraffe. On the right side of the picture, you will see the giraffe. E- even such large animals like the giraffe can hide themselves in the camouflage. This picture is also pretty interesting. If you can see few logs here, can you find the animal? type in type in yeah they they are two birds these are called tawny frogmouth birds the name comes from their mouth yeah they have frog like mouths but the not that's not the point the when they stay still their body color is such that they blend into surroundings they look like basically look like logs and that's one of the ways they hunt they are ambush predators and they uh, stay like that stand still and then snap at the predators whenever they come one more now this is a very interesting mechanism that animals have developed and that is of camouflage they hide themselves in the surroundings to 
basically hide from predators or from their pay, prey and basically to ambush them ambush their prey now now i'll i'll call upon my friend nina to uh, continue this journey through the animal kingdom thank you arshal okay so you all just saw some examples of animal which modify their body color texture or body shape to blend into the surroundings and basically hide but you may also know of an another animal called a zebra and zebra too has a very characteristic body color of black and white stripes but why do zebras have these stripes i mean they can't use it to hide in the surroundings right now you can look at this picture maybe you can guess why zebras do this well there's not actually a concrete answer but there are many theories and one such theory is that zebras do this to confuse predators uh, when a lion or another animal comes to predate on the zebra it only wants to capture one zebra for its food however zebras usually travel in herds and when there are large amount of zebras the stripes of zebras blend right into each other making it difficult to single out one zebra among them this is one theory uh, another theory must suggest that zebras might actually be camouflaging a lion can actually only see two shades of color in contrast to humans who can see three shades of color so from their perspective it might be possible that zebras camouflage in the uh, in the shadow and light areas of tall grasses a third theory is comes from a research that uh, scientists did back in 2014 scientists actually took some horses and made them and made and dressed them up in zebra costumes and when scientists observed horse flies who came to these horses scientists noticed that the number of horse flies that flew to the horses which were in zebra costume and which were not in zebra costume the number of horse flies was approximately the same however on the horses with the zebra costume the flies landed less like in less numbers than on the horses which didn't have of which didn't for a zebra costume now flies carry with them a germ causing diseases and are also a general nuisance so this might explain why zebras develop this stripe so that less number of horse flies lands on them now can you guess which animal this is if you can type it in the chat box below if your answer was a snake uh, it's incorrect if your answer was a caterpillar it's correct you can see this its legs and uh, on this on this tweet that is behind it uh, this the thing which looks like a snake head is actually the back portion of the caterpillar uh, now this can you guess which animal this is okay so this animal is an owl butterfly you may notice some mysterious marking on its body like there are regions of this animal which look like an eye now uh, what are these two animals trying to do with their body texture these two animals what these animals are trying to do is to mimic other creatures the one on the left is an animal known as owl butterfly where when this butterfly sits sits on a tree trunk it looks like an owl and those two spots looks like an eye they do this as to scare the predators the predators of this butterfly think that it is an owl and they don't attack it similarly the caterpillar scares off its predators by making them believe that it is actually a snake this form of uh, altering your body texture to mimic other animals is known as mimicry and uh, the previous examples as we saw animals hiding in the background that was no, that was a phenomenon known as camouflage uh, do remember though there is a great diversity in animal kingdom and not everything can be broken down into categories for example the zebra what is it is it a camouflage not exactly is it mimicry not neither that now mimicry is a very fascinating phenomenon in animal kingdom in the 19th century lots of nature naturalists observed that many of species of butterflies have very similar patterns for example here you can see the butterfly which is below is called as a monarch butterfly and the butterfly above is called a viceroy butterfly 
they are different species but they look remarkably similar why do they do this earlier scientists came up with the explanation that maybe one of these species of butterflies is actually harmful to the predators and the other species is mimicking it so that it took its protection it was found out that monarch butterfly has actually a very bad taste when predators eat monarch butterfly they spit it back out and then they never attack monarch butterfly again as a result scientists thought that viceroy butterfly change its body color to resemble monarch butterfly so that predators will leave it alone too this type of mimicry is came to be known as batesian mimicry however as time passed by scientists also did more experiments in some experiments they clipped off of butterfly's wings and then they gave it and they then fed it to birds in a lot of example it was found that yes when two species look to get look the same one of the species is in fact uh, a poisonous or or distasteful or not something along those lines and the other species is in completely harmless however when for some species of butterflies including viceroy and monarch butterflies it was found that both of them are actually pretty distasteful for the birds then the question arises why do these butterflies try to look like each other i mean think about it both of them are very distasteful to the predators both of them are getting protected from the predators then why are they trying to look like each other i would really like you to pause and ponder over this question because it has a really elegant answer so uh, so one possible explanation for this phenomena was given by fritz muller in 1878 he gave it using a mathematical model called frequency dependent selection which was one for, one of the first mathematical models ever given in biology what he said basically was imagine this there are there's a group of icer or butterfly and a group of and a group of monarch butterfly but they do not look like each other a predator will come it will eat one icer or butterfly find it distasteful and will not eat their group again it will eat one monarch butterfly find it found find it distasteful and then not eat monarch butterfly again in this whole process two butterflies died and now suppose there are many such predators there are n number of such predators n number of butter n number of icer or butterfly will die and n number of monarch butterflies will die now imagine a different imagine a different case in which all butterflies looks like each other a predator will come it will eat one from the whole group and then will find it distasteful and will not eat any other butterflies from the group again and now suppose n number of predators come it will eat a total of only n number of butterflies in the first case there was n from both n n from both species so two n butterflies died in the first case and in the second case only n number of butterflies died a mimicry of this type when where two harmful types of species mimic each other for their mutual benefit is called as mullerian mimicry now let's talk about a very fascinating phenomena known as mutualism mutualism is defined as when two species interact with each other from which both of them get benefit an example of this of mutualism uh, can be mullerian mimicry but there are also other very other very fascinating phenomena which we see in nature the image on the left shows a striped fish known as gobi fish and the, the you can see a shrimp beside it the, the name of this shrimp is a pistol shrimp pistol shrimps usually have very weak eyesight because of which it cannot sense predators pistol shrimps burrow in the sea floor and form burrows which they use to hide from predators and also find food the gobi fish usually remain while while a pistol shrimp is burrowing in the ground the gobi fish remains with the pistol shrimp the antenna of the pistol shrimp is always in contact with the gobi fish if gobi fish senses a predator sees a predator coming gobi fish moves back and forth very rapidly which by which through the antenna of the pistol shrimp gives it a signal that there is a predator nearby when this happens the pistol shrimp quickly hides in the burrow which it has created at at night 
pistol shrimp lets Kobe into its burrow and seals the burrow from outside, giving both of them protection from predators as they are while they are sleeping. On the right, you can see certain ants, an ant carrying an animal known as aphid. Ant and aphid also share a mutualist, mutualistic relationship. Ants, aphids, feed on tree sap and then excrete a sugary substance known as honeydew. And this sugary substance, uh, ants like this sugary substance. So what ants does, uh, what ants do is the same thing that humans do with honeybees, for example. We, let the, we build a house for the honeybees and let them, uh, we build a square box where honeybees can live and when they form colonies and make honey, we, we harvest the honey for ourselves. Similarly, ants let these aphids feed on tree sap. When aphids consume the tree sap and excrete honeydew, ants, ants, ants feed on the honeydew. In fact, it has been observed that ants also carry uh, aphids which cannot fly to feeding locations. Or they may also, or ants may also take the eggs from aphids to their nest in winter for protection. Basically, ants carry out the animal husbandry equivalent of aphids. Uh, another example on the right, you can see a clownfish hiding in the tentacles of sea anemone. Sea anemone's tentacles have sharp have sharp stings. However, the Sea anemone's tentacles are fo choked full of nutrients. However, the clownfish doesn't attack anemone for its anemone's tentacles for its for its nutrients. As a result, anemone doesn't try to sting the clownfish. Clownfish also has a thin coating of mucus on its on its body so as to protect itself from the stings of a sea anemone. That's how they stay together. What advantages do they find? To do they provide to each other? Sea anemones tentacles protect clownfish from clownfish's predators as they find it hard to come close to the clownfish. Clownfish bright colors attract prey for sea anemone. Now these are all examples between animals. There's also one species that you may have all know of, humans. Have you ever seen humans being in a mutualist, mutualistic relationship with animals? Well. In Tanzania, there's a group of people who live in forests known as Hatsa. In the forest surrounding these Hatsa people, there's li there lives a peculiar bird called Honey Guide. Honey Guide is very good at locating honeycombs in the forest. When Honey Guide locates such a honeycomb, it comes towards the Hatsa people and gives off a call. It then guides those Hatsa people towards the honeycomb. The Hatsa people cut down the honeycombs and to extract honey from them. When they leave, they leave, leave behind the rest of the honeycomb. Honey guides love the beeswax and grubs that are found in the remains and it devours them. This way, both Hatsa people and the honeycombs help each other. Now, let's come to the topic of mind control parasites. Uh, there's a organism called as lancet liver fluke. It preys on the livers of big animals like cows for example. It lives on the it infects the liver of the cows and and multiplies there. Then through the through the feces of that cow it is excreted and then it reaches the ground. Now from the soil it wants to go back to another cow's liver. How does it achieve this? Well, it doesn't have very good locomotory organs and also the distance is too big and the organism is very small. So what lancet liver fluke does it is that it basically infects an ant instead. Somehow enters the, end, the body of an ant through food or water. It will rapidly multiply and start secreting chemicals. These chemicals will control the mind of the ant the ant will start doing things according to the wishes of this microorganism. This microorganism then makes the ant climb onto the onto a blade of a grass and just remain there motionless. Cows which graze on grass 
accidentally swallow these ants as well. And this is how the lancet liver fluke gets into the body of the, co of the cow Ow. to restart its life cycle again. So basically, this lancet liver fluke compels an ant to commit suicide. There is also another example of the hair worm. Similar to lancet liver fluke, this hair worm infects a grasshopper and makes it go near the water where a grasshopper usually doesn't want to go. When, it, when the grasshopper goes to the water, it gets swallowed by a fish. The hairworm gets access into the body of the fish to infect it. Now, let's come back to the pistol shrimp for a moment. Pistol shrimp have two claws, but one of them is much bigger than the other. They have this power that if when they snap their claws, it, it expels out a jet of water at really high speed and a bubble forms rapidly and a bubble rapidly expands and collapses behind it. This process is really extreme and let me tell you why. The bubble expands and collapses so rapidly that it emits a brief flash of light. The temperature inside the bubble can reach close to the temperature of the surface of the sun. This process also makes a really loud noise with shrimps, with pistol shrimps making the loudest noise among all the other shrimps which is why they are called pistol shrimps. Why do shrimps do this? Well, the reason is to stun their prey. Now, it isn't exactly clear what actually stuns the prey. It is maybe the pressure created by the expanding and collapsing bubble or, or maybe it is the sound or maybe it is the jet of water, but prey do get stunned. There's another riveting example of such predation in the animal kingdom exhibited by the archer fish. If any insects is flying close to the surface of a water or sitting on a twig near the surface of the water, an archer fish will shoot a jet of water that will hit the insect so hard that the insect drops down to the water. The archer fish then gobbles up the insect. A link of archer fish performing this predation is given in the de description box. You can check it afterwards. So now we are in the concluding part of this session. What we want to tell you is that biology also has logic. You may you may have encountered study of living things in your school and in your school or college and you may feel like biology is all about labeling, labeling things and then memorizing these labels. Like there's a small part of like the eye and this conjunctive eye and retina and iris and lens and all sorts of things. However, and it's true, biology has a lot of stuff. Biology does involve a lot of memorization, a lot of labeling and other stuff like that. But biology also does have logic. There are also reasons why something happens. There are reasons behind animal behaviors. The biology may also involve a lot of mathematics. So biology is not completely random and that is why study of biology is, can be very fulfilling as well. Biology can also require logical reasoning. Bio there, are, there are reasons behind why certain things are the way they are, why animals exhibit the behavior they do. Uh, biology can, may also involve lots of mathematics. Uh, it may also require a lot of computational modeling. Uh, there are fields like ecology, evolution, bioinformatics, biostatistics that require mathematical skills. So that concludes our session. Here I would like to take a moment to thank Neha Brahma whose efforts, made, whose efforts went into making the amazing visuals that were required for this presentation. I would also like to thank all of you for attending today's session.